uh, and they know the difficulties of truth, and you never have to teach them to lie because they understand truth. And if you tell them something is not true and they find out, they will reproach you for it. You see, and, uh, and you know, if you say, J uh, Johnny, did you steal the cookie? And they say, what is truth? <laughs> you know they've been corrupted somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Pilate was not wanting to know the answer to the question. Right. He was trying to get off the hot seat. Mm -hmm. And he knew better. And people know what truth is. And, and actually, philosophically, what is called Tarski's definition of truth is just grass is green, if and only if grass is green. Grass is green is true. That's a statement that's true if grass is green. God is love. Tarski didn't say this. God is love. That sentence is true if God is love. And so truth is very simple, but it's embarrassing because it's totally merciless. It does not adjust to any. I, one of the things I do because relativism is so common, but it's so thoughtless. So I challenge my students when I get on this, and now I have to talk about this in almost every class, because you say, now why are we having this course? And you should watch the contortions that go into this. You know. And to try to get around it, well, we want to gain knowledge. And knowledge is important because it embodies truth. And truth is important because it allows us to have pleasant relationships with reality as distinct from unpleasant ones. Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. Right? Right. Reality is also what you can count on. So people are so embarrassed, they won't talk about truth. Research has replaced knowledge and truth. Mm -hmm. So we have research universities, right? Mm -hmm. That's the most common way of describing Oh, a research university. You don't have knowledge universities. There are no knowledge universities. You can't get a grant for knowledge. You can get a grant for research. <laughs> well, this question, uh, how you answer that question, whether you think that uh, you know a human being can know truth yes. uh, ha would have a great impact on whether or not a human being can know God. Absolutely. And so, how do how does how do our answers to that question of truth affect our spiritual lives? Well, profound, <laughs> profoundly, and um, I'm so glad you asked that question because one of the crusades that I have been on for years and currently is uh, to help people understand uh, the difference between having knowledge of truth and just having belief. And this is a big problem for our churches because many of them have accepted the repositioning of Christian teaching outside the domain of knowledge into something called faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that's enough to make people perk up their ears. But the Bible and the tradition of Christ is not a tradition of faith if you take it as something distinct from knowledge. It's a tradition of faith embodied, surrounded in knowledge. And you just read the biblical stories. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. That was faith. But he went out not knowing where he was going because he knew who was going with him. Right. Little David, when he goes out against Goliath, and you know everyone's saying, don't do it. And he's, he explains to them how he knows what will happen. Mm -hmm. It was his past experience. He knew that when that lion came out and when that bear came out, and he took care of them. He knew that he did not do that. And so when he went out against Goliath, he knew what he was doing. Faith environed in knowledge is what stabilizes our lives. Knowledge gives you the right and responsibility to act, to supervise action, to formulate policy and supervise its implementation and to teach. Faith does not give you any of those. 
And now you be, you may begin to realize what a position we've gotten ourselves into mm -hmm. in this country, mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. Is the church basically gave knowledge, I wouldn't say just to the devil, <laughs> but actually in our traditions in America, a lot of people feel that way. Mm -hmm. But what they did was they turned it over to the secular world. And the secular world said, we can take that. And so the universities progressed, and by and large, both the private and the public universities progressed away from faith towards something they call knowledge. But the way they handled knowledge put God away, and we know where that leads from Romans 1. That's the story about what happens, and that's what has happened. And many people, if they knew what is taught in some of our classes in our universities, they'd burn the place down. Hmm. And, and all these social issues that we talk about constantly, uh, and they are legitimate issues, but they are not open to truth. See, you know, diversity, for example, is something that came into the educational system hoping to enable people to have conversations, the effect of it has been to cut off conversations because each little group has backed up to itself and said, well, you know, we're diverse, so you can't attack us or you're attacking diversity, and diversity is a good thing, and so everyone just shuts up. There's almost no discussion about fundamental matters now on the campus. Hmm. May I shift gears a bit? Oh, <clears throat> get me out of trouble here. <laughs> no. Back to the uh, lecture you gave yesterday on the uh, the renewing of the mind, scripture in right. spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. And you made a, a big plea and for corporate scripture memory. Right. And one of our goals at the Henry Center is that uh, pastors would watch these interviews. And so say to those pastors who are out there watching this interview, encourage them the way that you encouraged us yesterday afternoon in corporate scriptural memory. And then one person followed up with a specific question asking, Dr. Willard, what are some practical steps we as pastors might take to lead our congregations mm -hmm. in corporate mm -hmm. spiritual memory? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just quickly related to the issue of transformation and renewing of the mind. Uh, first of all, one has to realize the human mind is pretty small. It can't take a lot of stuff and hold it, before, even at its best. So the real question is, what are we to occupy our minds with? Um, and the answer of our tradition uh, is with the truth about God and about human life under God. So then where are we to get that? And the answer is the scriptures. Mm -hmm. okay. So the point of all of this is to occupy the mind with the truth about God and about his relationship to us. And uh, one reason why I recommend Colossians 3 to people is it is such a compact and yet clear portrayal of what you do with your mind. Mm -hmm. And it starts with, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. See, seeking those things that are above is where you put your mind. Set your affections on things above. How do you do that? You know, you don't just sort of sit and roll your eyes back in your head and that's not it. You occupy yourself with the scripture. And that's why the Joshua 1 8 verse and Psalm 1 is so important in all of this. But again, Colossians 1 16 just says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you in all wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, now, how do you do that? And the answer is, uh, well, of course, you teach and you preach, and all, but it becomes an individual project of embedding the scriptures in our mind so that they are running there constantly, whatever our situation and wherever we are. 
And uh, so the way you do that is by memorization. Now you can get a lot of it just by attending good teaching. Uh, there's a lot of it in our songs. And so there are various ways you can do this. But my point that I have learned by my experience, both for myself and teaching others, is there is nothing that will replace memorization of passages of Scripture. So now if you're going to do that as a pastor, you have to get, up, get through all of the barriers that are already there in the minds of your people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to teach how to memorize, and then you have to get people to commit themselves to it, and that's where doing it together becomes so helpful and so important. Because, you know, it, it's almost true of any project. You get people into it together, and it goes better. And uh, I, I do this in retreats, and uh, I've, it, it works in a church if you will teach and lead it. But you want to have people who meet purposively to say their memory verses uh, to one another. And, you, and then you leave time for them to discuss how, how did memorization help you? Uh, you may, for a while, you may have to talk, how did you memorize because a lot of people think they can't and it's a really sad uh, misleading way of thinking about it. anyone can memorize if they will uh, repeat concentrate and understand and the repetition will mean things like this if you memorize a passage let's say John 14 which is a good one to start on then you will have to rememorize it so the repetition is not just saying it to yourself to get yourself to be able to say it. You have to, you learn that you will have to rememorize a passage like John 14, I don't know how many times. But after a period of this, it'll be like the back of your hand because it will be in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will say it without struggling because it's just there. That's where you want it. And that's the picture of the man in Joshua 1.8 who is murmuring or muttering the law day and night. It's in his mouth. His mouth is a part of his body. And you know, what's, what's interesting about our mouths is what comes out of them without thinking. And that's why we want the Scripture to be in our mouth. And that will make all the difference to us as well as to those around us. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, have a group, have a memorization <coughs> party, go on a retreat, and do nothing but sit around under trees and memorize and come back and talk about it, and there are just all kinds of ways you can do this. Hmm. I mentioned uh, also a, a one, just one, I think a, a wonderful program, just called the Bible Memory Association. I think it's located in St. Louis now. Um, and people can probably just Google that up and learn about their program. They've organized it. But you have to take it into your congregation and talk about it and hold it up. And it has wonderful ways of helping children and old people memorize. And I'll tell you the difference it makes in human life is unbelievable. It's one thing to have a high view of the Scripture and to say, well, it's the Word of God. It's another thing to embody it in yourself, and that's what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of uh, spiritual disciplines, Bible memorization, this is not any kind of... Um, uh, you know, new thing. No. <laughs> so I, I, my question for you is, has this, has this been something um, that the church has kind of always done but never, never, um, you know, central to the church's activity, or is it something that has been lost more recently? Well, I think it has been lost. And, uh, in fact, if you go back to the early, year, early, early centuries of the church, uh, in many parts of the uh, world where Christianity came, uh, ministers and deacons had to memorize whole books of the Bible. And we today look at Islam, where some people say,